people still popping in and um, good to see you all. Hope everyone's staying warm and cozy <laughs> this real winter weather we're having. <laughs> um, so I want to welcome everyone and, and say hello. And um, I'm just going to make some announcements for upcoming rounds. And then I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, um, Dr. Patrick Wilson. Um, so our next round, our other second February rounds will be February 18th. And we have Laura Bogart um, from Rand Corporation. She's um, uh, talking about addressing medical mistrust and strengthening resilience to intersectional stigma among Black and Latinx sexual minority men. And then I'll announce our two March um, uh, grand rounds. On March 4th, we have Dr. Monica Rivera Mint talking about health disparities and neurocognition in the context of HIV. And then our second rounds will be March 18th. And we have um, two of our own postdoctoral research fellows. Uh, first up will be Liz Liad Timmons talking about sexual identity, sexual behavior and pre-exposure prophylaxis in black cisgender sexual minority men, the N2 cohort study in Chicago. And that will be followed by Afole Mbako talking about black lives, parenthesis with HIV matter, address systemic racism on the journey to sustain undetectable viral load for black MSM. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Patrick Wilson, who is the co-director of our development core, along with uh, Teo Sanford, and um, is running our pilot studies program. And that's why he's gonna be introducing and running the, this rounds today. So over to you, Patrick. Uh, thank you, Bob, and uh, good morning. And thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, I am, as Bob said, uh, co-director of the Development Corps with uh, Teo Sanford, and one of the roles that I play is helping to manage the uh, pilot proposals uh, that we uh, annually uh, support. And um, as you all know, Grand Rounds has evolved to include um, investigator presentations, which I know uh, I'm not alone in thinking has been just great to hear about the work that um, so many investigators have been involved in. Um, and one of the things that Teo and I have implemented as a part of doing the pilot program in this cycle of the HIV Center is to ask um, uh, awardees who have completed um, or are in the phases of completion and, and dissemination of their pilot uh, findings. We ask that they come um, and share some of what they've learned, um, their experience um, uh, implementing the pilot, and of course, um, the findings that, that they have available. Um, and it's just a great way for us to better understand some of the, the work that, again, our investigators are doing, but then also the work that um, uh, we've identified as, as, as really moving our field forward and um, leading to what we believe will be other um, endeavors. So um, in today's Grand Rounds, uh, we have two uh, presentations and really two teams, I believe, that, that are, are, are presenting. And if I can, I'll start with our first and then I'll introduce the second, if that's okay, Bob, is that, um, I'm, is that, does that work? For me to do that, okay. And Steve is not. Yeah, you can do this. Yet. You can do that unless you want a break, and then and yeah, no. However, you want to handle it. <laughs> You've got all four of the speakers. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll start with our first presenters and ask them um, to uh, present, and we'll have some brief questions after. I believe this is how we've done it in the past, so hopefully that's going to work. Okay, I'm seeing a yeah. thumbs up. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then we'll have our second presenters. Uh, I'll introduce our second presenters and they'll uh, go and, and we'll have some questions. And I guess if there's time, we can try to synthesize and have uh, overall arching questions, but, but we'll see. We'll definitely make sure there are time. There's time for questions for both of our presenters. Uh, um, uh, this round is that it is in, in many ways uh, among family. Uh, I'm getting a sign that my connection is unstable, so I'm hoping I'm not um, breaking.
breaking up too much. Um, but hopefully you can hear me. We're hearing you fine no. now. It's a little bit wobbly, but it's, it's been okay. It's okay. Keep going. Okay. I'm sorry. This is always, you know, what we're dealing with for the last year now. Um, but the first presenters that I'm going to uh, introduce are Lori Bauman and Joanne Mantel. And again, uh, these are, are both uh, two very prominent um, members of the HIV Center and friends and, and family in, in so many ways. So uh, we, we know that Lori Bauman is a professor of pediatrics at the Einstein School of Medicine. She's also the co-director of the Biobehavioral Core uh, here at the HIV Center. She's been a long-term uh, leader in the field of HIV, particularly looking at adolescents. And she has uh, worked with Joanne Mantel, another uh, core investigator here at the center uh, on two or on several projects, one that they'll talk about today. Um, and just to briefly say that Joanne is also um, a professor of clinical medical psychology in the Department of Psychiatry uh, at Columbia University. And of course, she's uh, a research scientist at the HIV Center. She's um, been involved in so many different dimensions of the center and is currently a member of the Biobehavioral Core. Uh, the, the pilot that Joanne and uh, Lori uh, developed and implemented is uh, incredibly important and one of the first studies that we were aware of to, to really look at PrEP attitudes among adolescents and looking at it in a very comprehensive way. So. We're very excited for them to present findings from their pilot. Um, and the title of their presentation is, uh, What Do I Lessons Think About PrEP? And I will turn it over to, to Lori to take us from here. So good morning, everyone. And thank you so much uh, for that lovely introduction. We're excited to present uh, the results of this pilot to you. Um, Joanne and I have been working together for some years now on, on PrEP scale up. We've been looking at uh, primary care clinics and emergency rooms and uh, sexual health clinics and women. Um, and so adolescents, um, certainly close to my heart, was one of our priorities. And so we were um, particularly happy to get the pilot project funding to do this work. So, um, so why do this work? Well, 21% uh, of new HIV diagnoses are in youth age 13 to 24. Now we know that most of those are in the older age range, but HIV infections in young people precede diagnosis by almost four years, suggesting that HIV infections do begin in adolescents. And it tends to be a neglected population in 2017 only 9.3% of high school students had ever been tested for HIV compared to 32% of young adults. In May, 2018, the US Food and Drug Administration expanded the indication for PrEP to include at risk adolescents weighing at least 77 pounds. And that was because clinical trials demonstrated that PrEP was both safe and effective in adolescents. <clears throat> But adolescent awareness of PrEP remains very low. There's very little literature that examines adolescent attitudes towards PrEP, particularly in the United States. And HIV prevention activities for adolescents, as you know, focus mainly on behavioral interventions. Very few initiatives address PrEP and even required uh, reproductive health uh, classes in high schools rarely discuss it. Now, several states have approved the use of PrEP for adolescents age 12 to 17 without parental consent. And this further increases its availability and minimizes some of the confidentiality concerns that adolescents express. So our study was designed to get some in-depth information about knowledge, barriers, and receptivity to PrEP among at-risk adolescents who use sexual and reproductive health services at school-based health centers. We interview pediatric providers and community clinics and school health clinics as well, but we'll not be presenting that data here today. But together, this formative qualitative research was designed to help guide the development of interventions to make PrEP more accessible and to increase its use among adolescents who might benefit from it. So we conducted in-depth interviews with 30 students. These were all students receiving care at four school-based health centers in the Bronx, and they were between the ages of 15 and 17, identified as Black or Latinx, um, were HIV negative, 
They were all sexually experienced, able to read and speak English and able to consent to the interview. So when eligible adolescents um, presented at one of these four clinics, they were told about the study by the clinic nurse or receptionist who just made the, um, the knowledge about the study uh, aware to the students. They just emphasized that participation was voluntary, wouldn't affect their care or their access to services. And if the adolescent was interested, they were referred to an interviewer on site who confirmed their eligibility and obtained written informed consent and parental permission was waived by both the Einstein and NISPI Columbia Psychiatry IRBs. We conducted the interviews in English. They were done by four trained interviewers, audio recorded, they averaged about 45 minutes in length. The interview guide focused on knowledge and perceptions of PrEP, their receptivity to it, and potential barriers to its use. And we, we use the socio-ecological model as a general guide here. So one of the things we did as part of the qualitative work was to do a card sort. Not everyone is aware of what a card sort is, but a card sort activity is an activity where you put factors, we, what we did was put factors on each card that might influence their willingness or interest in using PrEP. And we asked them to sort the cards into three piles. One was important, one was not important, and one was not relevant. And the card said things like needing to take prep every day or how worried I feel about getting HIV. Um, af after they sort the cards, you go back and you ask them for their rationale for why they sorted the cards the way they did. And card sorts are really useful when you're asking people to talk about something that they're not very familiar with. Um, and it helps provide a more comprehensive list of, of responses to categories um, that they may, may not be considered uh, otherwise. The transcripts were coded inductively and deductively in deduce and we analyzed them using grounded theory. We examined the data for gender and race ethnic differences. There were a few gender differences, those are reported below, but we found no race or ethnic differences. So the mean age of our 30 participants was just about 16 years. We had 18 girls and 12 boys, 24 reported heterosexual, uh, uh, but uh, six were uh, lesbian, gay, or bisexual. 15 were Latinx, 11 were black, and four were mixed race ethnicity. 13 had reported two or more sexual partners in the last 12 months, and inconsistent condom use was pretty typical during both vaginal sex and anal sex. Six had had a sexually transmitted infection in the last year, and nearly all had reported being tested for HIV. So of our 30, uh, 16 had never heard about any medication that could prevent HIV, whether it went by the name PrEP or not. Um, but of those who did know something about PrEP, nine had received that information from television or online platforms. Only four received that information from a healthcare provider or health educator, and a few heard about it from siblings, friends, or peers. The participants who had heard about PrEP knew it could prevent HIV, but there were considerable gaps in knowledge. So we described PrEP to everyone using a script, and almost all were really enthusiastic when they were informed about it and felt it would empower them to have control over their health. Wait, you're telling me that it exists, right? This exists? Okay, because I never knew. I thought there's no way to have prevented except for condoms. Eight wanted to use PrEP immediately. 12 said they would use it in the future when they felt they were at higher risk for HIV. The most um, frequently mentioned barrier was confidentiality. Over two thirds said they were concerned that using healthcare services might result in their parents finding out about their PrEP use and thus that they are sexually active. Participants were less active to use PrEP if they believed that the provider, the clinic, or pharmacy might disclose their private health information to their parents, or if their parents had to be with them during the clinic visit, or if they had to involve their parents in order to access PrEP services. One young male said, I believe that everything should be confidential. Teens are out here wanting to get privacy that they need. When something is leaked information toward their parents, they are more likely to have talked to their doctor again. Just like, okay, I don't want to have that issue where I'm being yelled at or scolded or even kicked out of the house. Seven named the school-based health center as a place where they would go to receive confidential prep services and reasons for their responses, including their experience uh, with the clinics. They trusted the clinic and the provider to maintain their confidentiality and their parents did not have to be involved in order for them to get care. One young woman said, I would go to the school clinic because I know that everything they provide is confidential. 
But if it's like a clinic that we'll go to with my parents, I don't because I know that the information I tell them would get to my parents. Another major uh, barrier was adherence to taking a pill every day. 11 said the daily adherence would be different, difficult. And eight out of the 18 girls said that versus three out of the 12. And some of the girls referenced their experience with birth control pills for that opinion. They said things like they were forgetful or that they didn't have a daily routine or their, their schedules were inconsistent day to day. Several mentioned that they weren't home every day. Some said that they were just not at enough HIV risk to justify all that effort. Some had an aversion to taking any pill and some had had negative experience with other medications. One young man said, I mean, I'm not really a pill taker. So if you need to take a pill every day, that's gonna go through a lot of, that's gonna be a struggle for me, I ain't gonna lie. And a young woman said, listen, that's a lot of work. I wouldn't wanna take that. Now, almost very few of the adolescents voluntarily mentioned side effects um, as part of our inquiry about, uh, about PrEP. But when we asked about it in the card sort, nearly all expressed concerns about short-term and long-term side effects of PrEP. And they wanted more information about the potential risks. One young man said, if I take PrEP every day, it might help me prevent HIV, but I might be doing something else to my body that I don't know about. So it's very important. As I said, I will need to find out about the side effect phase because I can't rush into taking PrEP without knowing the side effects. I need to find out about the side effects so I know what I'm taking in my body. We also explained that if you were on PrEP, you would need to have, see the doctor every three months or so for follow-up appointments. And I was surprised to find that 29 out of the 30 were positive about that. I think they liked the idea of being monitored while they were taking this medication, but 10 faced challenges to keeping those appointments. Many of them talked about having a busy life, lots of extracurricular activities and scheduling them would be a problem. Some talked about travel and travel plans as getting in the way. Some were concerned that such frequent visits would raise suspicion of their parents. And some said, well, life just happens and things uh, get in the way of keeping these appointments. But again, participants mentioned accessing PrEP from the school-based health center would make it easier. One young woman said, it wouldn't be difficult if I could, like if I could come to the school and get, see a doctor, but if I have to go outside to a hospital, then it will be more difficult, more challenging because it will take time off my life and it will just intervene with whatever I've got going on. And then when asked in the card sort, a few raised cost as a potential problem and asked whether their insurance would cover it. Um, one young woman said, um, if it's covered by my medical plan and how much does it cost, I think if it's expensive, then students will just, people will not be able to get it. A barrier that did not appear was stigma. None of them felt that, or very few felt that taking PrEP would be stigmatizing to them. 25 denied that they would feel PrEP stigma for themselves. One young woman said, I feel like my actions are my actions and what people think shouldn't really affect me because PrEP is a way to take care of yourself. So it shouldn't be any negative thought, that's it. And another young woman said, one is if your parents found out or if your partner found out, I feel like you should just be happy that I'm trying to prevent getting HIV instead of worrying about what I'm doing. I feel as long as I'm taking care of my health, there shouldn't be a problem. But eight students said that other, there, others may encounter stigma from other people. For example, one young man said, people might say like, because you're taking PrEP because you have the disease. So they might say like, you're not normal or you, he has something or she has something or they have something. So that's a form of bullying. So like it can really break down a person. And only four talked that said that taking PrEP might cause internalized stigma, might promote negative self-perception such as shame, depression, or fear. However, two of these four also said that they would not be personally susceptible to stigmatization of PrEP use. One young man said they wouldn't feel right about themselves, some people. And a young woman said another thing that would prevent them is probably like being scared and like ashamed of getting on PrEP. So we documented a series of barriers. Um, there's a stunning lack of awareness and knowledge about PrEP among adolescents. Um, and many who were at risk for HIV did not see themselves as particularly at high risk and therefore didn't think they needed PrEP. Several talk about how hard it is to adhere to medication and to the provider visits. They all want more information about medication side effects and reassurance that there wasn't gonna be any long-term or short-term effects. 
Um, many fear that PrEP use would reveal that they're sexually active to their parents. Um, and they talked about difficulties in accessing clinics and appointments and perhaps affordability. But there's some good news. There are facilitators of PrEP. The teens had a very favorable uh, perception of PrEP and did not feel that, most did not feel that stigma was a barrier to PrEP use. In fact, teens said that it would empower them and give them autonomy over their own health and safety. Providers are considered trusted source of PrEP information, but not always trusted to provide confidential care. So there's a mixed message there. And school-based health centers were considered accessible and trusted sources of care that could mitigate some of the um, barriers to PrEP distribution. So clearly we have some limitations here. As a pilot, our participants were recruited from school-based health centers in the Bronx where they had previously received sexual health care. So this sample is obviously not gonna represent the experiences and perspectives of adolescents across the United States, particularly those who don't have access to a school-based health clinic or who are not regularly engaged in care at all. Um, in terms of next step, we are working with the school-based health leadership at Montefiore, which has one of the largest school-based health programs in the country, to uh, figure out ways to initiate PrEP availability in the school health clinics. Um, and we are also planning a study of parents to understand their attitudes toward PrEP uh, for their teenager. But school-based health clinics are in only 2,500 of the almost 24,000 US secondary schools. And while investing in school-based health clinics to distribute PrEP um, would be a very wise thing, it would only reach a few teenagers. So we have to figure out ways to integrate adolescent tailored PrEP services into trusted confidential healthcare settings to ensure that they have access to PrEP. And we fully intend that all stakeholders, adolescents, but also their providers and their parents be included in our plans. We had a talented and enthusiastic team who worked on this project. Their names are here. Um, all of the work that I've presented is a team-based effort and I thank them all for their work. And I would be happy to take questions. Thanks, Laurie. That was a great presentation. Um, if anyone has a question, feel free to unmute and ask away. Hi, can I ask a question? Yep. Nice talk. Um, hey, Lori. Um, as you know, this is very important to me right now. <laughs> um, so this was great. Um, and I'm going to bug you for slides, but well, I have a lot of this from you. Um, you know, I, I guess I have a question around issues around um, stigma. Um, and, you know, I know I talked about it with you, but I'm wondering if you have other thoughts. It's a largely heterosexual population. Um, and so now I'm wondering whether some of the stigma that's being found in other studies like CUIMC's school-based health program has more to do with sexuality, sexual um, lack, you know, breaking of confidentiality around um, same-sex behavior, just concerns that young people um, coming into their sexual identity on the heels of um, a cross corteo did, but also in communities of color where there may be a lot of stigma around this, whether maybe that's, it's more related to some of that and what PrEP implies. Yeah, or do you have I, any I, other thoughts? <laughs> yeah, I think um, one of the reasons I was surprised is that is that there's a lot of PrEP stigma in adults. Yeah. So we found it in women. We've done a study of women in OBGYN clinics and they report that they would not feel good about themselves if they were on PrEP. Um, and uh, we've, we've seen it in primary care clinics. There's a sense that somehow it's a, a weakness that you can't use condoms consistently and therefore you're failing somehow if you need to take PrEP or that it suggests promiscuity. So I'm not sure it's completely um, uh -huh. uh, a function of, of, of the LGBT stigma that certainly is, is there and certainly in communities of color. Um, the teenagers, um, uh, both the girls and the boys, seem to feel proud about the possibility of taking control over their own risk. And so, um, so I certainly think a larger study is warranted. And um, I think this, this pilot gives us some um, interesting ammunition for a larger project, either in R21 or in R34, um, in where we can focus more, <clears throat> more specifically on uh, young um, uh, adolescents of color who are LGBT identified. Well, it's great that you're doing this and such important messages. So thank you to you and the team. Thank you. The, 
This is Abigail. I have a, a quick question um, that was really interesting. Um, I didn't, I'm wondering um, if there was any sort of uh, reaction or in, in terms of the discussions you were having where PrEP was sort of uh, invoked uh, in a kind of relationship dynamic um, for the participants and how they talked about potentially like negotiating sexual decision making like with a partner. Um, it was you know, prep invoked uh, in a kind of different sorts of like kind of a relational capacity. <laughs> um, you know, and, and I did, I may have missed that part if you described it, but just interested in whether, you know, how, how that would um, kind of be taken up for individuals who are sexually active and how they kind of think about PrEP vis-a-vis -vis their, like their partner. Um, if it's there a was great sort of question. A diet. Yeah, the diet. Yeah, great question. Um, and, and there was no liter there was no hint of that mm -hmm. in the in these interviews. The kids did not talk about PrEP as something they negotiated with a partner. They talked about it as something they did for themselves. Mm -hmm. In the data we have from the women, relationship is the primary focus. They, they talk incessantly about whether they should <clears throat> tell or not tell their partners. Some of them saying it's none of their business. Some of them saying I couldn't possibly take PrEP without talking to them about it. And if I tell them about it, they're gonna think I'm cheating. And there, were, there was a, a huge major theme about the implications for relationships. This, it was not a theme here at all. Okay, interesting. Yes, this is Nadia. Um, can I ask a follow-up question? Do you, do you think that's because the adolescents are not in like longer term relationships as opposed to the older women or um because you know i feel like in you know like when you hear about prep acceptability like in other contexts like in sub-saharan africa like you do hear a lot about partnerships and and it being negotiated with partners and and actually a lot of the stigma and worries come from partners and you thinking that you don't you know trust your partner and whatnot so I'm just curious what if you have any thoughts on why why it might not have come up in this population. Um, I think it might be because it's so new to so many of them. Even those who had heard about it hadn't really understood much about it or knew that it was available to them. And so it may be that only after they start to take it and they have to deal with these issues that the, it'll start to become a theme for them. Um, they do have long term relationships. Um, uh, so some of the, uh, as I said, there's some who have had more than two partners in the last year. Many of them have had one partner that they've kept for some months or a year or longer. Um, and I think part of the issue that they haven't had to deal with yet is how do you introduce PrEP into an existing relationship? And that might come up um, if, if we actually started making PrEP more available. Thanks, Abigail and Nadia. Any other questions for Lori? If not, uh, then perhaps we can move on to Abigail and Rachel. Great, and, and thank you, Lori, um, for that great presentation. And um, I'm looking forward to hearing more about, about this important work as it moves forward. Um, so we're gonna to move to another uh, pilot project. Um, and this time it's another team, a large team that includes uh, many um, investigators that uh, are central members of the HIV Center as well as uh, affiliates, um, including uh, Pete Gordon and Michael Yin. Um, but I'm thrilled to uh, have two uh, presenters to discuss um, this pilot uh, that includes um, Dr. Abigail Bain Lance, who's uh, a medical anthropologist um, <clears throat> and formerly with uh, the CUNY School of Public Health. She is an, uh, a member of our Implementation Science and Health Outcomes uh, Corps, and she is currently at the Bronx Veterans Administration. Uh, in a geriatric research center there and an assistant professor at, in the Mount Sinai uh, Department of Geriatrics. Uh, and she's going to also uh, co-present with um, uh, 
Rachel Finkel, who is a research, research associate with the Implementation Science uh, and Health Outcomes Corps and a medical student at UCSF. And um, they will be presenting on managing comorbidities in the context of COVID experiences of older adults living with HIV. So I'll turn it over to Abigail. Thank you so much, Patrick. It's a pleasure to be presenting. Um, and we actually have, <laughs> we have been struggling with keeping to time since we have so much we want to share with you all. Um, and so we will try to not rush, but be, <laughs> be stealth and quick uh, in, and hopefully in discussion uh, issues we're not, that we don't raise um, in our sort of presentation part can, can, can come out. Um, so yeah, it's a pleasure really to be sharing this very, this preliminary analysis uh, with you and our work to date um, with Rachel uh, around managing comorbidities, particularly in the context of COVID, our experiences uh, or the experiences of older adults living with HIV and um, our, our attempt to explore those experiences. Um, so we are going to first uh, sort of give the lay of the land around our original pilot study uh, design that uh, we submitted. But um, as will become clear in the next few minutes, um, this quickly turned into a, uh, kind of a COVID informed study. Um, and we're gonna talk about uh, data, our data collection uh, instruments um, and how we're trying to kind of integrate the pre and the post uh, COVID um, in a sort of over, overarching uh, approach. Um, and then we're gonna drill into one component of our COVID specific, our COVID period data um, around telehealth experiences, um, given the importance of telehealth right now in uh, access and delivery of healthcare. And then uh, briefly talk about some of our next steps planned. And this slide also depicts our team. Um, like Lori, we are uh, a, a large um, and committed team. And this project really is a labor of love as we've uh, charted some rough waters over the last uh, sort of months, I suppose, and <laughs> months into years. Okay. So um, just a sort of dropping anchor at this story of our project, um, and perhaps others can relate. Um, so we started, we embarked upon what we thought would be a, a sort of, you know, not necessarily linear research process, um, since it so rarely is, but uh, predictably curvy. And in fact, we've had a more circuitous and diverging kind of experience. Um, but it, you know, we we due to COVID, but but finding and that we're able to explore questions we hadn't anticipated before, and um, and and that this could be very you know productive. And we're really um, you know from the out our orientation to our our in our pilot and is really to be uh, to explore how the work that we're doing is relevant and can contribute meaningfully to a kind of emergent um, world. So um, where did we start? So the uh, pilot study we submitted was entitled multi-level barriers to effective comorbidity management for older individuals. So as is familiar to this audience, um, the uh, individuals living with uh, HIV, the population overall is aging. Um, usually that's considered 50 years or older. And as individuals age with HIV, um, they are acquiring uh, additional conditions, health conditions. And, um, and so um, individuals are, have three, typically three, um, on average three or more um, uh, comorbidities uh, along with their HIV. And so our project was really interested in um, barriers to comorbidity management, um, both the, the management, but in particular, the referral process where primary and specialty care are needing to um, be coordinated or harmonized around care, perhaps in new ways. And we designed our project to take place in the Columbia uh, New York Prez um, academic hospital-based setting, but also conducting uh, data collection in, in community-based healthcare settings um, in the Hudson Valley. Also comparing more urban, uh, urban to rural or, or semi-urban contexts, and that was really our first aim was to look at multi-level uh, factors operating as barriers within management, and then aim two was had more of a, a sort of intervention uh, orientation to 
attempt to identify strategies um, that could support the mitigation of those barriers that we would identify in AIM-1. Um, with COVID, uh, we uh, we actually, Rachel will get into this in a minute, but we, we uh, amended our AIM-1 to include um, looking at conditions created by the COVID-19 pandemic. Rachel, you might be on mute. I am. So mm -hmm. since we uh, wanted to focus this presentation on our telehealth findings, we made this timeline to show how our data collection maps onto the telehealth rollout at our two sites in the Hudson Valley and here at uh, Columbia New York Presbyterian. And we, so we received funding and began meeting in spring of 2019 um, and then got IRB approval and started data collection in winter of 2019. Then we paused data collection um, due to the pandemic in mid-March. And at this time, there were widespread closures of clinics at both HRH Care and Columbia. Um, around May 2020, both of the ID clinics, uh, both of our sites began doing telehealth coaching for patients. And around July, um, the HRH clinics opened up to in-person care with a 40% target for telehealth delivery. And Columbia's specialty clinic started to open up as well with about an 80% telehealth target. At that time, we started data collection um, also in July. And then uh, HRH care continued to scale down their telehealth in the next um, following months down to 25%. And then we finished data collection in November of 2020. So in the initial design, which is sort of in this, this left column, we designed surveys for patients and providers that would be used to inform qualitative interviews with both of these groups. We completed provider surveys, which are here in purple, uh, and four of the provider interviews in blue before COVID. And we had completed about 10% of our patient pre-COVID surveys and interviews in March when we um, stopped data, or 10% of our surveys and just two interviews when we stopped data collection in March. So when this happened, instead of using our old survey tools, we created a new COVID specific patient survey that combined quantitative and qualitative data collection. And uh, which is in yellow here. And then we hope in the future to use our patient data to inform chart reviews that will further flesh out the narratives of patient care that we've started to, to gather from patients. So this is a summary of the topics covered in each of these tools. Uh, so the data collection tools cover a range of overlapping topics. All of the tools ask about the range of comorbidities that patients from each clinic are living with. And it all, they also all ask about patient social support. The tools that we designed before the pandemic ask about the pre-COVID specialty referral process and referral barriers, and the survey instruments ask about referral outcomes. The provider interviews and the pre-COVID patient survey ask about privacy and HIV disclosure. And in our provider interviews, we also ask providers about their frameworks for HIV and aging. Okay, so um, now again, so that, that was the overview of all of our different uh, data collection instruments and now moving into the COVID period data methods. So um, focusing largely on the, the survey that Rachel just described, this verbally administered and recorded semi-structured Qualtrics survey where we asked about 45 questions uh, in both English and Spanish. And um, most of them were conducted by phone, but some of the surveys at the sort of latter part as the clinics reopened um, uh, on the Columbia side were conducted in, uh, in person. And we asked uh, a range of topics focusing on the period um, between mid-March with the New York State pandemic pause um, and the time uh, and the date when the survey was taken covering um, in more depth the, the topics listed. Um, just to highlight, uh, the telehealth is the focus of really today's um, talk, but we did capture um, 
information about sort of mental health, uh, social support, and we talked about COVID uh, and their experiences with COVID as well. So in that period, we, uh, the period of, of data collection, we were able to collect 80 surveys um, between July uh, and November. And we had conducted some of the provider surveys in that pre-COVID period, um, but not all of the, our anticipated sample. And so we collected six uh, or conducted six provider interviews um, during this time period ending also in November. Um, okay, so this is a pretty busy slide and I'm gonna try to do it justice very quickly, but it's, a, it's our conceptual um, framework for our analysis. So this is, you know, overall the pilot is mixed methods and, uh, and as well as you specifically the COVID piece. So we're integrating um, a qualitative um, narrative analysis approach and would be interested for those um, participating today um, who are familiar with narrative analysis, our attempt is to really integrate what might be considered sort of the structured uh, data, all of the uh, capturing, all of the encounter points that uh, each participant has um, by visit type, format, triggering health issue and follow-up, really trying to capture that over time, over the survey period, um, and then doing a thematic analysis across the entire uh, a group of surveyed individuals around um, prominent concepts and ideas with the hope of really integrating the structured and the thematic to better understand um, those sort of trajectories of care and what, what are the, the patterns in, um, if there are patterns in those trajectories as well as how we make sense of that. Then integrating the quantitative um, descriptive and summary statistics to complement that analysis to better understand and develop the care trajectories, a deeper understanding of telehealth, ideas to optimize its use, telehealth interplay, especially with existing disparities, which hopefully will kind of come through in the next uh, couple of slides. And then of course, the overall goal is to then integrate it with all of the pre-COVID data and that chart review that Rachel mentioned. So transitioning to the demographics of our samples, we conducted interviews with 11 providers with a range of roles in the clinics. And for our patient survey, of the 80 patients we surveyed during COVID, 17 New York Presbyterian patients were surveyed in English with the remainder of surveys at both, or 17 were conducted in Spanish with the remainder of surveys at both sites conducted in English. Uh, our particip participants were all between 50 and 73 years old, which was consistent across both sites. Half of our participants are men, half are women, with a slightly greater number of women than men in our Spanish language surveys. Um, one of our participants is a trans woman, and we didn't have any trans men or non-binary participants. Roughly a third of our participants identified as Black or African American, all of whom were interviewed in English. Around one quarter of our participants identified as white with a slightly higher representation or percentage at HRH care. Um, and then a third of our participants identified as Latinx with a slightly higher representation at the Columbia site. Patients that we surveyed stated that they live with, on average, four to five medical or mental health issues in addition to their HIV infection. We had participants identify medical issues in their own words. So this is sort of a combination of symptomatic complaints and formal diagnoses. There was a wide range of comorbidities identified, uh, but the top uh, five were arthritis or joint pain, some type of mental health uh, issue, lower back pain, hypertension, and diabetes. Okay, so moving in now to some of our findings, I'm going to focus on issues around technology access, and then we'll move to uh, issues of quality around uh, um, telehealth. So this uh, graph uh, is the uh, distribution of responses to the question, how do you regard the importance of technology for telehealth? So from the left column, the green, the green columns are the, the total percentages across uh, the two sites. Um, uh, and so nearly it's around 18%, almost 20% overall, uh, with a higher proportion of Columbia respondents uh, saying that they, they don't have technology for telehealth uh, at all. 
After that, around 21 percent, uh, 20, 22 percent, um, a little higher for HRH. Uh, re responded by saying, I don't know how to work the technology and no one is here to help me. Uh, almost 4% uh, said I have disabilities making it difficult to use technology. Um, around 9%, slightly higher for Columbia, 10% said I didn't feel comfortable speaking with my provider by video or phone. Um, and then of that, so that represents roughly half of the responses, and then, then around half of the response, uh, other responses uh, re reported they didn't have any challenges with technology, with 40% uh, re responding in that way in the Columbia sample and 60% at HRH. Now, and we haven't done any sort of statistical analysis, but we are trying to point out where we know some potentially key differences when we move towards a sub-analysis. Sub so then trying to dig in a little deeper in terms of what that means. Um, so that first 20% that really described not having any access to technology itself, um, one of the, oh, I think you can move to the next one. One of the providers um, in their interview called this a technology gap. Um, so these were responses in, in sort of fleshing out that response saying, I don't have a, a technology. Individuals described not having internet, also not having devices like smartphones um, to, to, to use, download and use um, uh, telehealth technology. And one respondent says, I don't even know how to use a VCR. I don't have a smartphone and don't know how to, to run it. Um, so this, this sense that this not being kind of a participant within um, the, the, the realm of technology. Um, and then to the next slide, um, so getting into the sort of other responses around um, not necessarily feeling like individuals have uh, the technology and can use it. Um, we heard about limited comfort with telehealth technology in different kinds of ways. So uh, a kind of recurring phrase was, um, I'm not savvy or a provider saying, you know, some, some patients are not savvy with technology. They may have the technology, but they're not able to operationalize it for telehealth. As one participant said, I wouldn't know how to work it. But what we're also finding at the same time is an interesting thing where these same participants who described either not being savvy or not having telehealth would, would reference other um, technology that they use on a fairly regu regular basis. So the particular quotation here is an individual um, who's Spanish speaking who says, I have the app, uh, like the, the telehealth app on the phone now, I don't know how, uh, what to do with it. But then later in the survey set, describes at length um, uh, communicating with um, a, a, a parent, a mother in Santo Domingo um, using WhatsApp. Um, so, and says, I know how to use it. So, going towards those last four lines. There's a little thing at the top. So if you want to talk on the phone, you call. There's also the thing to use the video. Yes, WhatsApp has it by video. So lots of detail about using WhatsApp, but you know, a lot less um, comfort with the particular app um, needed for telehealth. We also thought it was important that, that individuals were really disaggregating or, or describing you know, different modalities of telehealth. So for example, um, several individuals talked about the use of MyChart or the app to do visit scheduling or look at results, but that was very different than using telehealth for video, uh, for medical encounters, either video or telephone. So for this individual, um, talked positively about um, the messaging. It's very good. You send the message and the doctor answers. It's very good. I like it. You can also make your appointments and cancel them, um, but not for the medical visit. I don't like it. It is very good for many things. There are the exam records, everything is there, but I like the face-to-face -face visit. Another key theme um, or sub-theme around the disparate modalities had to do with um, the way in which we might be talking often when we think about telehealth about video appointments, but actually a lot of our participants are really using the telephone um, in terms of their medical encounters. Um, and so this will be part of the structured analysis, but we found rough in general, many more individuals getting their primary or specialty care by telephone. Sometimes that was because the video didn't work um, or there was instability and sometimes the video um, wasn't tried at all. And 
and a couple other themes related to this telehealth gap. One was um, articulating the importance of setup support. So, so um, the importance of either needing support and not receiving it or describing how the support enabled them to use telehealth. And then there was another um, sort of sub theme around initiation barriers. So we note that several individuals didn't really have any familiarity with the con seemingly with the concept of telehealth. It didn't seem to have been introduced to them. Um, and then another group talking about, um, or were we able to kind of um, infer that that in missing the encounter via a telehealth opportunity really exacerbated um, um, the lack of making an initiation link um, into care, especially subspecialist care, finding that to be a pretty important thing. So now we want to get into the actual experience of telehealth described by our participants. Out of 38 patients who had at least one HIV primary care telehealth appointment, well over half stated that the telehealth appointment was worse than previous in-person appointments, with fully three quarters of Columbia New York Presbyterian participants endorsing a worse experience. So our qualitative data also points to some potential reasons or context behind this finding. As Deborah Lupton and other sociologists of telemedicine have already described, our data is revealing telemedicine to be a fundamentally different type of healthcare. And our qualitative findings reveal the, the qualities or texture of this kind of healthcare. In terms of the technical component of the experience, as Abigail sort of started to talk about, patients describe a range of technical qualities to their appointments. Some had um, smooth encounters, but many described glitches or challenges with technology resulting in delays and sometimes even cancellations of appointments or people just giving up. Um, this patient describes an attempt at a video telehealth encounter here on the slide saying, I sat there for 20 minutes waiting for the doctor, res doctor to respond. And when she responded, we couldn't hear each other after all that. And then she called me and that's how we were doing it. Even among people who preferred in-person visits, participants said telehealth, telehealth was conditionally good for the context of the pandemic. Like this participant who says that he would love to see his provider in person because it's much better, but he doesn't like to take chances as an HIV patient during the pandemic. Our participants also noted the lack of physical exam in a telehealth encounter as a missing piece of their standard care provision. A number of people mentioned that. And because most appointments are held over the phone, limited visual communication was another um, often cited challenge. One patient says here on the slide that video is better than no contact, but in person is better than video because she can express herself better because she talks with her hands. In our structured analysis, which we're not yet presenting, but we identified at least two patients just who described telehealth encounters that lacked appropriate interpretation. And studies that I've referenced here on this slide show that language discordant encounters with inadequate interpretation depend more on nonverbal communication. So the lack of body language and other visual cues is likely leaving patients with limited English proficiency at a disadvantage in telehealth encounters. And some of the provider participants that we interviewed expressed that primary Spanish speaking patients already receive a lower quality of care. And so these instances raise a concern that telehealth is exacerbating what is already an, an existing disparity in quality of care. Patients and providers also state that in some encounters, telehealth is substandard compared to in-person encounters. Additionally, we collected, again, in the structured analysis, instances of patient-reported suboptimal care. For example, one participant who received a physical therapy referral for the wrong side of her body. Um, and even before COVID, providers described the referral system for specialty, specialty care as a two-tier system based on insurance. One participant says about telehealth, our electronic e E telehealth consults just as good as in person consult? I don't know if we know the answer to that. I say for many things, probably not. And so, therefore, if the system is messed up and we can't get appointments for our patients, and then we're like, we'll try this telehealth suboptimal approach. 
So their concern is that telehealth might be a suboptimal addition to an already dysfunctional system. So what we wanna pull out of this analysis is um, understanding the nature or quality of telehealth, um, but also looking at what telehealth can make possible, but also on the other hand, what is required of telehealth to make it possible or to optimize it. So one thing that we know telehealth makes possible is a healthcare visit without travel. Um, it also potentially enhances the role of the patient in their own care. And the other side of this is that telehealth requires a certain capacity for self-care, similarly to what Nellie Utzhorn describes as patients becoming diagnostic agents within telemedicine. We primarily observe this in the form of patients taking their own vitals and making global assessments of their own health as they decide whether or not they can be seen in person. Both providers and patients also stated that to optimize telehealth, an initial in-person visit was really needed to establish trust. And finally, we see that patients and providers are already creating their own schemas for what kind of care works for them over telehealth. And we think that decision-making could be supported by building shared understandings of what can and cannot be accomplished with this modality. Great. Um, so coming to the end of our, our time, um, you know, directions were, were planning to we're taking and, and and the work we were we're continuing to do is to further develop and enrich this narrative analysis approach to build up this the structured patterns and trajectories of primary care and specialty care and then map the themes that we're describing um, to those trajectories um, we also want to further our sub analyses focusing on disparities uh, in quality and access um, and the, the point Rachel was just making around um, this idea that, you know, the pre-COVID system was, uh, had challenges within, and those were the kinds of things we were, uh, that were unearthing in our sort of pre-COVID um, data um, around comorbidity management. Our, our hope is to be able to better understand that and then also think about how those issues may be exacerbated in this COVID and post-COVID um, era um, and of course how to ameliorate that um, and just on those two points wanting to you know think about the implications of this and and uh, again as everyone is I'm sure following and and quite alarmed about the disparities in vaccine distribution um, that are being reported you know we see our work here uh, as being uh, linked up with um, the efforts to try to better understand, uh, critique and intervene into those kinds of um, disparities. And there's a relationship between telehealth um, access and access to vaccination, uh, we know. So that could be an area to develop. And then as Rachel also described, we're very interested in telehealth uh, guidance or criteria that could be developed um, in light of, of the kinds of things we're thinking about in primary and specialty care. And maybe that also pivots back to our aim to hope to develop strategies or interventions towards um, larger research uh, in the future. And then this is a slide of some of our um, you know, sort of concrete next steps or opportunities around proposals, manuscripts and, and conferences that are on our radar. And then beginning uh, or ending where we began, here's uh, the list of our team uh, that you saw in the beginning. And, and this is, as, as we said, is really very collaborative and I, I really welcome the whole team to to chime in as we turn to questions. So thanks, thank you everybody. Thanks Abigail and Rachel, that was really great. Um, again, everyone, if you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself. So. You were just so thorough, the both of you there. <laughs> right, hardly. <laughs> but I guess also in, invite, I'd love to invite our our uh, our collaborators, our team, if uh, to build off of any of any of the points we've made or anything you want to make sure we've un, you know get underlined or reactions for sure. Yeah, maybe I'll just make one comment, which is uh, just a uh, one sort of 
one correction and then one comment. Um, actually, uh, at the Columbia site, CHP, we, we never closed and reopened. Uh, we stayed open every single day um, of the epidemic. Uh, in fact, for a time, we were the only in-person open clinic that could take sexual health referrals from the city STI clinics. So I want to, I want to, I want to acknowledge the incredible dedication of the staff at CHP, some mm -hmm. folks who got quite ill during that period of time. Mm -hmm. um, second thing, which I think, you know, which is really something which I, I'm hopeful as the work we've talked about this goes forward can really help explicate is the kind of perverse incentives to move to telehealth that exist on the structural level of the, of the institutions. Um, we were told early on, though we stayed up, that we should convert our visit volume to 80% telehealth, even though we found that maintaining a 50% level, we could maintain the appropriate social distancing and, and, and compliance with the um, prevention guidelines coming from the hospital. And these incentives are, you know, there are obviously some benefits for patients, but the, the actual cost savings that hospitals can reap by not having to maintain the physical infrastructure is hard to ignore at the level of hospitals are trying to close giant economic shortfalls in the wake of this. Um, and second, there's a whole series of incentives for providers to convert to, you know, to telehealth visits. Um, some of them in the best interest of the patients, many of them in the best interest of providers. So I think this is really a super important direction to sort of explore further. And then as maybe Jason could comment, Villarreal, who really, you know, we have seen in the last week and a half how the reliance on Epic Connect to schedule vaccination appointments um, have, have really exacerbated this gap in access among our elderly patients compared to those who might have less of an IT um, existing knowledge gap. I don't know, Jason, if you want to mention anything about that. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you. Um, it's interesting as 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 we were talking about telehealth, I don't know if you saw I kind of got distracted. One of my care coordinators here, we have a really dedicated team to help people get connected to the app and to my chart. She came in because one of my patients just came in to do labs and he's supposed to see me tomorrow. Um, and I have actually never done a day of telehealth. I've always been here, even on when I'm doing video visits, because I want to be here, and I, I don't have I'm I'm able to, so I'm that's good. Um, but she said she spent 20 minutes trying to get him to get the app to work, and she couldn't get it to work. So I said that's fine. We'll just I'll see him in person. We'll do a phone call, whatever he wants. Um, but I've had the opportunity to talk to my patients, and then also yesterday I was a. Uh, a volunteer interpreter at the vaccination site um, at the armory. Um, they actually, I'm signed up to also give vaccine, but they actually just needed interpreters. And I didn't sit for the whole time. I was just running to this place, that place, this place, that place. And um, so many of the people that we serve just cannot understand the app, the, 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 complexities of the app. It's not, it's something for the, so for the vaccine, somebody has to um, go to the NYC website or through the NYP website and then enter, put in a password, create a profile, create a password, remember that password, step, 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 step. And it's, and for so many patients, it's so insurmountable. So then for the vaccine, um, uh, they, that, they, people would say, well, your other options you can call. And we all know that hotlines and phone lines are just beyond overwhelmed. So as we all probably have seen, what was happening, um, what had been happening is people who were, had access and ability, by ability I mean that they work from home, um, they maybe can crowdsource on social media or via email chains to try and get access to the vaccine. They were all showing up here to get vaccinated while people who live in the neighborhood were just couldn't get through the app. Um, so I think it's very, very timely and very in the moment urgent that we really look at the, these issues and how the disparities need to be addressed um, and evaluated. And I see somebody had um, 
actually put in a question about what were the, some conditions that participants thought could be useful or good for receiving telehealth, um, or did the university feel in person is, is better than telehealth? No, um, it, they didn't. Um, there were pe people definitely talked about what was good about telehealth. Um, so um, as a provider, I will say it's great. For example, if I have some patients that I would love to have a, every one or two weeks a blood pressure or diabetes check because we're, we're really titrating therapy, it actually, when it works, it's amazing. We can, I send them a blood pressure monitor or send them, you know, their glucometer and we can titrate, we can, we can make adjustments without them having to come. So patients said that that's great. In the interviews, um, there was, as um, I think uh, Rachel spoke about, um, some people would say it's great because I'm worried about, you know, being HIV positive. I just don't want to be out. So this is great as an as a alternative in this time. Um, and one interesting thing, there's a lot of things that we also don't realize could be very good. So I had one lady was talking about working with the uh, diabetes educator. And she says, I like when I have the video because I can show her the exercise I'm doing. She's always telling me to do exercise. So it's almost like, you know, having like a video exercise little session. So there can, there are definitely, I don't think we want to go into saying that it's all gloom and doom. I think when it's done, when it's done well and when it's done collaboratively with patients and with communities and community voices, we can really see how can we optimize this and how can we find situations where, you know, normally maybe I'll be like, oh, I don't really want to call this person back to come back because it's really hard for her to get her, get in a car to get with her walker and all this, all the steps to get here in the snow. And I just want to check her blood pressure. If we can figure out how she can do it or if her daughter can help her and we can all be together, that's amazing. And we've all done that, I think, as providers. Um, so I think that there are definitely, um, to the question about saying um, how, you know, uh, what were the conditions, I think it really depends on what the, what the person, what the patient is telling us. We, we work together and tell us, tell what, what do you think could work for this? Um, and how important would it be to have an established relationship with your provider to going to the telehealth for treatment? Um, I think it's so crucial. I think we spoke a little bit about this earlier. Um, somebody had said, uh, we had talked about that in the telehealth gap, um, that there, there's kind of initiation barriers. Some of the experience that we've had with some specialties that I've had as a provider and, and with my patients is that the initial visit is all telehealth for some specialties. Um, and because they don't want to bring people in, they close and all. So we talked about the issue about if some if it's if that's the initial visit and it, it doesn't work, then the patient never gets connected to that specialty because they, they they miss the initial visit, so we can't reschedule. And then they're put in the queue of new patient, not returning patient, which is harder to get an appointment for a new patient. But I think um, it's it is crucial as um, we as we spoke about in some of the data that we we collected that. Um, having that first visit um, to build trust. Um, I think any provider, many providers will tell you that's true, but almost all the patients say it's, you know, it's great to see the person, to talk to the person, to see. I've had patients say to me, I just want to see what you're like before I decide if I'm going to come back. So that's, it's so hard. We all know this. I mean, no one likes Zoom um, when you can do in person. You want to get to see the body language, see the person. Um, and as we spoke a little bit earlier about the language issue is so crucial for people who, who do well enough in English, but that body language is just so crucial um, for, for everybody involved. So I think that there's, I think ultimately the, the conditions are ask and then listen, which has kind of been my mantra as, as a provider always is ask the person, what do they need? And then listen to the needs and then figure out how do we collaborate to make this work? Cause I've told some patients, let's do this. Let's do a video visit next in two weeks to check your blood pressure. And like they, they said, I don't have to come back. I said, no, we, we can do this over the, over the video. And they're like, great, that's wonderful. So, but they know me and they trust me. And, you know, so it's, it's not some new face. So it can, it can definitely be optimized. Thank you, Jason, for sharing your experiences there. Um, Anthony, do you wanna go ahead and ask your question? Uh, while we wait for Anthony, if anyone else has a question. Oh, Anthony, go ahead. You know, that was me, Stephen. Oh, Ofole? Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm seeing you as Anthony. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, well, we're very close friends, but we're, we're still <laughs> people. Um, I thought that was a, a fantastic um, 
uh, presentation. And um, Abigail, I haven't met you, but I've heard your name a lot. I'm a provider over with uh, in the clinic with Pete and Jason, um, and also an HIV Center fellow. Um, and I think I, I agree um, just how important this is going to be in terms of you know the direction. Um, I think healthcare delivery will go with telehealth. Um, you know, and we hopefully one day will. Uh, start to move uh, past COVID-19. And, and I really worry about that. And I had two questions. One was about um, health literacy um, and the other was about, um, you know, kind of the exacerbation for lack of a better word of institutional racism. And I had a kind of um, patient anecdote to explain this. So I had a patient who he, he had a, you know, a terrible stroke in March um, and he was hospitalized for that stroke. And then in his workup, um, found out he was HIV positive. Um, came to me a couple months after that, found out he has high blood pressure, he has diabetes, he has a bunch of different medical comorbidities. Um, he's also an elderly, uh, not elderly, he's an older African-American gentleman, so he needs, a, he needs colonoscopy, he needs a lot of kind of healthcare maintenance. And so I've been helping him kind of navigate the system and I've realized just how much health literacy he has that has allowed him to actually get to those appointments. He's also been in physical therapy. He's been in speech therapy for the sequelae from his stroke. Um, it's taken, it's been such a labor to try to get him the care he needs via telehealth. He's had lots of canceled visits. He's had um, a lot of kind of um, issues where he's been told to do one thing with one medication and it wasn't clear on one call. And then he was told something on another video visit. And so uh, I guess the first question is, is health literacy. How do you think about um, people coming into an already complex system and then changing that to a very, like a mostly technological platform? And then the other side of that is when things go wrong, when an appointment's canceled or something in the system doesn't work, or he has an interaction with a provider um, who he's never met before. Um, he actually had an encounter with a provider um, who was scheduling him for his colonoscopy. He was a young white gentleman and I think was very um, distracted and you know wasn't really paying attention to the screen and stuff. And so his explanation to me was, you know, this racist white doctor didn't care about me and the colonoscopy got canceled. And if I get colon cancer and I die from it, that will be the cause. And I really, I, I worry about a system that's already failing people of color at such a level and introducing this new um, mode of healthcare delivery without um, a very specific understanding of how racism, inequality, all of the things that we are, you know, kind of trying to center as a um, as a community now, how those things play a role. So I just wanted to see, kind of, especially in your subgroup analysis and your next steps, um, how you kind of think about those issues. Thank you so much um, for those accounts um, and very important critical comments and with questions as to what what do we do with this? Um, I mean, and I in, invite the whole team. Um, I guess I can, you know, I think that you know the, the kind of questions you're you're asking are the same ones we're asking in in part. Um, I mean, one one way to to, re to respond. Um, we are also trying to grapple with uh, the idea of, you know, his historic uh, and institutional uh, disparities, uh, racism, uh, structural inequities that then are refracted through this, this COVID-19 pandemic into, you know, sort of new systems or revised systems that aren't responding to ameliorate those problems, maybe exacerbating them or making, um, or sort of are worse in different kinds of ways. Um, and where does the, you know, where the, does the telehealth fit? I mean, uh, in terms of like, are this pilot is, a, is, is mo modest, it's a modest number. Um, we tried to build in variation by, initially our focus was on setting variation, but I think um, as the team interest of various team members brought attention to the, the focal point of also thinking about language and language and access and being sure that we built in um, Spanish language, of course, you know, and there are other language groups we haven't included, but you know, that could, could be and should be going forward. Um, 
I think one question we're asking is the different kinds of uh, diversity within our sample and what can we learn about people's experiences um, where we can feel we can make claims within this small study to then expand it into a larger one. And some of those, and so it, some of the, the differences were we found between the HRH sample um, and the Columbia sample, I think that's something we're trying to really focus in on um, with some greater analysis, both statistical analysis, as well as how that inter intersects with our thematic analysis to try to understand what's sort of working together what like what are the different factors or features that might be working um might be as associated um so you know is it we didn't show you a lot of the demographic details because um you know we, we didn't have enough time but we are finding that for example our hrh uh individuals who participated were on average had attained more formal education had access to attaining more formal education compared to the columbia sample um, even though age um, basically held at around 60 across the two sites, um, we found that more, uh, a, a greater number of the participants in the HRH sample reported having some employment compared to, or had some access to resources through employment compared to the Columbia sample. So, I mean, one thing we're really interested in pursuing is how, um, you know, we can better understand how some of these issues with access, I mean, maybe this isn't, you know, this isn't groundbreaking or shocking, but, you know, are really running with resource, uh, the resources people have available. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and also, is there a question of rural and urban that will become important too? Um, so I guess one way is we're trying to better understand the nature of the problems, <laughs> um, you know, and, and whether there are some subgroupings um, that are having better or worse or different kinds of experiences that could help sort of illuminate what this picture looks like um, and then help us figure out how to you know leverage it to be Absolutely. within launched conditions. So I mean I guess that's a kind of analytic response um, and I think also our narrative analysis is, is attempting to better understand the nature of you know what is the impact of as Jason was describing you know not having that initial visit and so you know what happens after that for the participant for example um, who Rachel mentioned who where the referral was um, for uh, physical therapy but it was ordered for the wrong side of the body you know what happened next you know can we better understand not just you know what the problems are but how is that bearing upon you know people's lives and their unfolding. Um, uh, experiences, uh, their unfolding health needs, and if we can, you know, describe it well, um, then maybe we can better see how how what we know is sort of um, these great inequities, how how they're actually pl playing out, and then can figure out how to offer something better. Um, and at what level, you know, is it an intervention into the system? Is it a better behavioral support tool? <laughs> you know, is it targeted towards providers? Is it targeted towards patients? I mean, it's probably not one or the other, but I think those are the kinds of things we'd like to pose based on deeper analysis. Well, and I think also I'd like to um, say, uh, you know, to a full it, what you're saying is we have to intentionally confront these questions that you're talking about, like the, and they're very, you, you used very intentional words of exacerbation of institutional racism. And I think that's not, that's not necessarily just at any particular institutions across the board. And as, as, a, as, a, as a kind of industry, we have to, we have to confront that. Um, but I think that we need to look at what has been happening and really take the voices that we are hearing in these kinds of studies, in these kinds of, um, analyses of subjective data of of words to hear what what are people trying to tell us that doesn't maybe fit into a into um a, a survey by number by by and so um i think that you know for example the issue of having telehealth being as being a gateway is so pete to what pete saying you know a lot of institutions are trying to move this way but we on the ground who are doing the work can show all the issues the problems with this and i think we need to make sure this comes out so like yesterday when i was at the at the doing interpreting at the vaccination center i was called to help because they had heard this research i'm doing there was a woman there who had had a stroke in november and had a telehealth visit with her pcp in november right after the stroke and then 
she said they were supposed to i was supposed to follow up a month later but i've tried calling i've tried nothing is working but it was it was based on that telehealth visit and you know at a lot of these sites at a lot of the clinics there are pay, there are staff who speak spanish who know the patient who make it easier but when it was done telehealth she was being called probably by somebody else she said science people would call and they didn't speak spanish i don't know what they said they spoke english so it, it, I just happened to be there and I knew people and I made things happen so we could get her connected. But that was one person. Um, and that is, as, as you say, Ophelia, that's an institutional issue. We have to really, we have to lift up and amplify these voices and say, you know, what is happening? Because we, 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 want, to, we want to do better. We want to focus on the, on the people who don't have those, those, that access. And we need to make sure that that's actually happening. And in terms of health literacy, we also need to really check our own assumptions. Um, so, you know, many times somebody, it's well documented that someone who speaks another language than the dominant language of the place where they're in is automatically looked at as lower intelligence, even subconsciously. They, they're looked at as, as maybe not having the savvy, not having the intelligence, whatever. And in interviews that I had, I was talking with people who were from Latin America who were, lawyers who are activists who are workers who are architects um but then when they come here they just barrier after barrier after barrier so it's not an issue of necessarily education or or intelligence or savvy or whatever many times it's just that the structure they don't you know the structure is not built to incorporate people like them and um and we need to look then at the structure and maybe the problem is not with the patient but it's with the structure Thanks, Opolia, for that uh, question. That led to this really great discussion. Um, unfortunately, we'll have to cut off the Q&A there. Uh, thank you for everyone for participating, and I'll hand it over back to Patrick for closing remarks. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you so much to um, these excellent presentations, as, as Bob just noted in the comments. Um, this has been a, a great treat for all of us. Uh, but particularly Teo and I, um, uh, I know uh, we know very much that that both of these teams worked incredibly hard on these pilot projects and um, dealt with a lot um, in terms of getting uh, these this work off the ground. And so we're just so happy to have seen um, it get this far and to continue going. Um, so just thank you so much to Lori and Joanne, to Abigail and Rachel, and to all the teams. Uh, for both of these projects, um, great uh, examples of the kind of work that we like to support um, through this pilot uh, program. I just wanted to also note, um, we, you know, through uh, the, the listing of participants, we're seeing a lot of new faces and, and names, and we invite you all to please come back and join us uh, for Grand Rounds. We uh, will be having Grand Rounds again in two weeks on February 18th, where we will have um, Laura, Laura Bogart speak with us on addressing medical mistrust and strengthening resilience to intersectional stigma among Black and Latinx uh, sexual minority men. So we hope that you'll come back and join us on uh, February 18th, and we look forward to seeing you then. But thank you so much to the team uh, for this incredible work. Uh, have a great day, everyone. Take care. Thank you so much.